TVP number 141, Vanu Defined, The Semantics of Freedom. Note, the following is another classic Vanu article by former co-host uh, Kyle Reardon. In this short piece, he lays out the definitions pertaining to this liberating freedom strategy, uh, compares and contrasts it with other words like freedom and liberty, and clearly explains why, uh, why Vanu is a worthwhile pursuit for, quote, liberty in our lifetime. Check out TVP number one, Foundations of Vanu, for more. Please enjoy. Quote, you have certain rights, period. And what the government does cannot change that. The government is a thug and a thief. Be on your guard, watch it with caution, for it is powerful. But do not be awed by it. Do not grant it respect or moral sanction. Treat it as you would any villain. This, rather than political action, is the course I would recommend to libertarians. And the likelihood of its success is no less than the prospect of dismantling the government from within. Granted, it lacks the flashy trappings of political campaigns. There'd be no campaigns and media hype. It would be a quiet revolution and one that is largely decentralized. It would entail dozens of different strategies. It would take a long time and it wouldn't be glamorous. End quote. George H. Smith. Tyranny itself could be described as institutionalized coercion. Given that the state is a territorial monopolist in the provision of law, then legal abuse, a.k.a. lawfare, becomes a fait accompli. As such, it is folly to think that controlled schizophrenics and political crusaders would be able to shrink the power of Leviathan through reformism. If vulnerability to coercion is the foot in the door for, author uh, for authoritarians, it becomes self-evident that reducing vulnerabilities might just provide a way out. How could this be accomplished, though? Vanu, briefly defined, is the invulnerability to coercion. The word itself is an awkward contraction of the phrase voluntary, not vulnerable. Throughout the 1960s, Rayo birthed this concept. He said, quote, Apparently no English word exists for invulnerability to coercion. Sovereignty comes close, but it is usually applied to, the st to, to states and implies not merely self-defense capability, but power over others. This is not surprising, since the very concept of invulnerability to coercion of individuals and non-coercive groups is relatively new, at least in European, uh, European cultures. The traditional attitude is rule or be ruled. There are no alternatives, end quote. Ray was correct about so-called sovereignty, because sovereigns are legally defined as rulers. I pointed this out during an interview where I was helping to draw attention to the oxymoronic sovereign citizens, now called American state nationals, and their fake judges. This is also why I have emphatically discouraged voluntarists from describing themselves as being sovereign, because to do so means that you are declaring yourself a ruler. And by definition, anarchists want to live without rulers. Why can't libertarians rely upon the government, uh, government's monopoly laws in order to enjoy invulnerability to coercion? Rayo explains, quote, Liberty depends upon laws and their interpretations, and so is easily destroyed. Vanu, while not necessarily illegal, depends upon reality, not legality, and so is more durable. End quote. A distinction is made here between freedom, liberty, and Vanu. Rayo considered freedom to be the total absence of coercion, liberty to be a general exemption from coercion, and Vanu to be an invulnerability to coercion. Taking this typology as given, it would seem to be the case that Rayo placed little faith in the efficacy of government laws to secure liberty, if at all. He further compared and contrasted Vanu and liberty by saying that, quote, Vanu and liberty interact in various ways. Achievement of Vanu tends to increase liberty also. Vanu also, also fosters other Vanu. Large-scale use of liberty, on the other hand, tends to reduce liberty. A large degree of liberty, long continued, reduces Vanu, end quote. From this description, Rayo perceives the relationship between Vanu and Liberty to be a zero-sum game, much like how a seesaw works. Vanu is portrayed as both self-reinforcing and a benefactor to Liberty, whereas greater exercises of Liberty are not only self-destructive, but also antithetical to Vanu itself. Therefore, as Rayo saw it, if you want to pursue freedom and or Liberty, then you ought to practice Vanu exclusively. While these observations might well be fascinating, how does this insight help one in dealing with the beast that is the state? Rayo explicates, quote, A state can be truly limited only by Vanu, its inability to impose servitude and collect taxes beyond a certain amount, not by liberty, such as constitutional checks or a permissive king. A state which doesn't plunder as much as is possible within a social technological environment, or which doesn't use the plunder effectively to perpetuate its power, will tend to be replaced through political evolution, revolution, or foreign conquest by one which it does. This is one of the reasons why political crusades to repeal coercive laws or have them ruled unconstitutional are a waste of effort. 
or worse, end quote. As the cherry on top, Rayo's strategic viewpoint here is that laws do not restrain tyrants, but practical impediments to the initiation of the use of force does restrain tyrants. For example, search warrants are pieces of paper that theoretically prohibit the government from engaging in dragnet wiretapping, whereas cryptographic encryption has the potential to actually stop them from invading the privacy of your communications. At the end of the day, though, Vanu is not so much about providing a solution that satisfies the whims of every ideolo ideological variety known to mankind, but rather points a way out for individuals to engage in self-liberation so that they may enjoy some degree of liberty during this lifetime. You've just heard TVP number 141, Vanu Defined, The Semantics of Freedom, uh, an article, a uh, classic Vanu article authored by a uh, former co-host uh, of the Vanu podcast, Kyle Reardon. If you want to read or uh, listen or uh, check out the show notes for this episode, you can do so at vanupodcast.com forward slash 141. Thanks. 2048, the second volume in the Brushfire thriller series, takes place in the not-so-distant future. In the second half of the 21st century, the War of Ideas took place. The creation of second realms and individualist decentralized freedom cells spread across geographical regions, and the practical ideas of liberty, voluntary interaction, and peace took hold. The Free Society in 2048 is loosely based on Samuel E. Konkin III's Phases of Agorism, in which the destruction of the state would be realistically accomplished through the establishment of pockets of free individuals, black and gray markets, and the spreading of the ideas of freedom and liberty until the demand for an overarching state was no longer perceived as essential, and individualism and voluntary interaction prevailed. The original creators of the freedom cells who led the world to a better place are still scattered about living their lives, including Maxine, the late Henry Tucker's love, and the now washed up but stubborn punk rocker Warren, still reside in the Appalachian Mountains. Maxine's nephew, Vince, and his boy Tommy, who had been van nomads ever since Tommy's mom left to pursue a materialistic quest for fortune in the never-ending rat race, went to visit Auntie Max on her homestead on Jim Mountain Road. Although Max is very happy for the visit, she has an ulterior motive. Her close friend she met during her revolutionary days, Isaac Hopper, is trapped in a geographical area previously known as New York City, now known as the State Zone. The State Zone is one of only a handful of remnant states where an overarching power-hungry government rules over its citizens with aggressive force. Together, Warren, Vince, and Tommy team up and use their knowledge, including advanced hacking techniques, low-tech ciphers, IRC-encrypted chat, and cryptocurrencies to infiltrate and evade the authorities in the state zone and bring back Isaac to freedom. But their mission, the rescue of Isaac, Auntie Max's close friend and confidant, isn't going to be easy. They are up against a powerful authoritarian Hydra state a massive surveillance apparatus, a relentless and murderous police state, and a propaganda arm that will not stop until extremist terrorists known as the TRIO, Warren, Vince, and Tommy, are brought to justice. Will the TRIO pull off the rescue of Max's longtime friend, Isaac Hopper? Will the forces of good, free individuals, prevail against the safest forces of evil? Find out in the second volume of the Brushfire Thriller series, 2048, available exclusively via Liberty Attack Publications. Just visit libertyunderattack.com forward slash 2048. Again, libertyunderattack.com forward slash 2048, or snag them both in the Brushfire bundle. libertyunderattack.com forward slash 2048 bundle. Liberty Attack Publications, share your story, find your freedom.